Praise the Lord, everybody. Come on, praise the Lord, everybody. Amen. It's good to be here. We've had a great week. Amen. And I have been blessed by the music and the preaching and the teaching, the workshops and the testimonies. Praise be to God. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank our president, his lovely wife, Dr. and Mrs. Emmanuel Osei. Can we praise God for them this morning, everybody? For their leadership, their warmth, and I'm grateful to God for them as they have ministered to me and to my family this week. I want to thank uh, all of the ministers, the pastors, and all the colleagues, the leaders here today, our leader of our division who is here, the, the Wales Mission is here, my good friend Pastor Jackson is here, woke me up early this week, well it was early for me because you know I'm six hours behind, come on say Amen. And he said, Bertie. I said, it has to be nobody but Pastor Jackson from the North England Conference. But it's good to see him, Pastor Sweeney, and all the other pastors that are here. Praise be to God. But I praise God for you. What do you say, everybody? I praise God for you. I have fallen in love again with the UK. Amen. Somebody's been so kind to me, they even gave me some UK cufflinks. Come on, say amen. And it even matches what I have on. Praise be to God. Hallelujah. But I am so grateful to be here. God has been so good. This has been a rich experience. Uh, Pastor Perry, you said it best. This is a high time. But you did have me laugh when you said you got one foot in the grave and one foot hopefully will be back. It can't be next year. I said, have mercy, Lord, help him. But it's, but it's been a good experience. But I've come to praise God. Oh, let me say that again. I said, I've come to praise God. Now, if you have fought for a seat, it's hot. You've been sweating. We ought to take this time to praise God. Amen. All right, let me try it this way. Now, we've had everything. We've given gifts. We've had baby blessings. We've had singing. We've had praying. I'm going to preach the word of God. Amen? Amen. Everybody took their time. I'm going to take my time. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Dr. Osei didn't bring Pastor Bird to come for a sermonette. Sermonettes are for Christianettes. What do you say, everybody? So I, I come to preach the word of God. Now, you've got a good media team here. You know, I see the jib is here and the different shots that you're taking. Because, you know, with television, we have to be aware of these things. So let me tell you what I've done, Dr. Osei. I met with the media team. And I told them, it looks like your shots are pretty good. Make sure you get my good side. Come on, say amen, don't you? Don't, don't, make sure I'm not sweating, amen. You, you, you can't have shine. What do you say, everybody, all right? I said, Dr. Osei, this is a good media team. I was so impressed. So this is what we're going to do. If our recordings can be good enough today, we're going to take our recordings and we're going to use them on Breath of Life. And so you'll be able to see yourself on 3ABN and the Hope Channel. Come on, everybody. Hallelujah. All right. Now, that means you can't get stiff. You got to say amen. amen. If your neighbor's sitting next to you and they fall asleep, nudge them. Come on, say amen. Got to nudge them, all right? So this, this is how we'll do it. Hello, this is Dr. Carlton Bird, and I'm the speaker director for Breath of Life Television. Now, I am excited today to be in the United Kingdom. Let the people of God say amen. amen. This is a great camp meeting. We have called it reclamation evangelism everywhere to everyone. And the pastor of this great assembly of family of believers is Dr. Emmanuel Osei. Can you give Dr. Osei a hearty amen? amen? Amen. If the cameras go right to him, it's that tall gentleman sitting right there. And he is so happy and praise God for him. So we are ready now to get in the word. What do you say, everybody? All right, getting the word. Is my friend still playing? Amen, amen. We're still playing. I'm looking. All right, amen. All right, so that's the intro. You're going to edit that. You're going to send that to me, and we're going to use that so everyone will understand I'm not at Oakwood, but I am at the SEC camp meeting. Is that all right, everybody? All right, we've got our intro. We are ready to preach the word of God. Take your Bibles and go with me to the book of Exodus. What book, everybody? Come on, talk to me. What book, everybody? 
Exodus, it was read so eloquently, and we, we want to read it again because people are watching our broadcast. Exodus, Ezekiel, what am I saying? I just did that to make sure you were listening. Amen. Come on. Ezekiel 37. Ezekiel 37, verse number 1 is where we want to go today. Ezekiel 37, verse number 1. Ezekiel 37, verse number 1. If you have it, let me hear you say amen. amen. All right, we're ready. The Word of God said, the hand of the Lord was upon me and carried me out in the Spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley, which was full of what, everybody? Come on, full of what, everybody? And caused me to pass them round about. And behold, there were many, very many in the open valley, and though they were very what, everybody? Come on, they were what? And he said unto me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord God, thou knowest. Again he said unto me, prophesy upon these bones and say unto them, O ye dry bones, hear the word of the what, everybody? Thus saith the Lord God unto these bones, behold, I will cause breath to enter into you, and ye shall what? And I will lay sinews upon you and will bring up your flesh upon you and cover you with skin and put breath in you, and ye shall live, and ye shall know that I am the what, everybody? I am the Lord. And so I prophesied. And as I was commanded, and as I prophesied, there was a what, everybody? And behold, a what, everybody? Shaking. And the bones came together, bones to his what? Bone. And when I beheld, lo, the sinews and the flesh came up upon them, and the skin covered them above, but there was no breath in them. Then said he unto me, prophesy unto the wind. Prophesy, son of man, and say to the wind, thus said the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived, and stood up upon their feet in exceeding great what, everybody? Then said he unto me, son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say our bones are dry, and our hope is lost. We are cut off for our parts. Therefore prophesy and say unto them, thus saith the Lord God, behold, O my people, I will open up your what, everybody? Come on, I will open up your what, everybody? And cause you to come up out of your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. And ye shall know that I am the what? When I have opened your graves, O my people, and brought you out, up, up out of your graves, and shall put my spirit in you, and you shall live. And I shall place you in your own land. Then shall you know that I, the Lord, has spoken it and performed it, saith the Lord. Now I'm ready to preach the word of God. Are you ready to hear the word of God? I said, I'm ready to preach the word of God. Are you ready to hear the word of God? This is the day the Lord hath made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my word, everybody. Hallelujah. Father, bless us now as we go into your word. Anoint us with your spirit and, Lord, sprinkle out your grace. Forgive me of my sins and hide me behind your cross. Lord, we need a word from you today, so disappoint us not. So may your people not hear me. May they not see me, but see thee and hear thee living and working through me. And when the appeal time comes, move in this place, O oh God. Forgive me of my sins and hide me behind your cross. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Let everyone say amen. amen. And amen. We need a revival. We need a what, everybody? Come on, we need a what, everybody? All right, let's get to it. The first 14 verses of Ezekiel chapter 37 can be divided into two parts. Verses 1 through 10 record the vision Ezekiel sees, and verses 11 through 14 provide its interpretation. Now, let's be clear this today. Ezekiel doesn't have a dream, but Ezekiel sees a vision. Because there's a difference between a vision and a dream. Do I have a witness in this place? A dream is a series of thoughts, images, and sensations that occur in someone's mind when they're asleep. But a vision is a supernatural appearance that conveys a revelation. In the text, Ezekiel's not just seeing something in his sleep. Ezekiel is not just dreaming, but Ezekiel is receiving a message from God to be revealed to God's people. Now, what Ezekiel sees in vision is this. It is described in verses 1 through 10 as dead, the nation of Israel is, dead, dry, and in the valley. There had been a fall in the Israeli capital. Israel's temple had been burned. The Israelites had been slaughtered. Israel's nobles had been banished, and Israel's life was extinct. So then returning success to the nation of Israel was like speaking of the restoration of vitality to dead, dry, bones 
in the valley. Now to be dead is to be no longer alive. To be dead is to be extinguished, lacking luster. To be dry is without moisture. It's to be cold, unfriendly, uninteresting. To be low is to be in a valley, a low area. So then Israel was no longer alive. Israel was extinguished. Israel was cold. Israel was unfriendly. And Israel was in a low area. Its economy was destitute. Its people were indigent. Its spirit was lifeless. Its nationalism was non-existent. Its socialism was decadent. And its spirituality was absent. The Israelites had become the living dead. Ezekiel's job was then to communicate the need for spiritual renewal, spiritual revival, spiritual reclamation, spiritual rekindling in Israel so that the glory of God could return to Israel. Now, there was, however, a problem. What was the problem? The people had misunderstood some things about God. Number one, they thought that God was limited to one place that God was localized, that God was restricted. And because they had been exiled into Babylon, they thought that God had abandoned them. But not only that, number two, they had a misunderstanding of who God was. They thought that God wouldn't allow any opposing military forces to uproot them from their land and relocate them somewhere else. In other words, they didn't think God would let them get beat up and pushed around by their enemies. But somebody knows. Sometimes God allows you to go through some fire so you can come out as pure gold. Do I have a witness in this place? And so the image of Ezekiel 37 is a depiction of the reanimation of life granted to us by the Spirit of God. That the Spirit of God can breathe life back into tired lives. That the Spirit of God can renew and restore and even revive that which was once alive but is now dead. But then how could revival of a fallen nation be possible when its spiritual life was diseased, decadent, distressed, and deteriorating? For when you are weak spiritually, everything else is going to be weak. For how can one move? How can one grow? How can one live when one is unresponsive to God's call, unmoved by God's claim, and unchanged by God's character? Are we who come to church every week? Dead, dry, and in the valley, in the church, but spiritually dead. No zeal, no energy, no enthusiasm, no Pentecostal fire for the Lord. You see, it's one thing to be in church, but it's another thing to be in Christ. It's one thing to be in the building, but it's another thing to be in the body. It's one thing to be in the sanctuary, but it's another thing to be in the spirit. Everybody that's in church is not in God. Everybody that knows the Bible does not know Jesus. Everybody that has religion does not have faith. And everybody talking about heaven ain't going to heaven. Ezekiel says that the hand of the Lord carried him to a valley of dead, dry bones. Now let me stop there. The text says that the hand of the Lord carried him to the valley of dry bones, which means God called Ezekiel to ministry. Ezekiel just didn't stumble upon the valley. The hand of the Lord took him to the valley. If God had not called him in the first place, he would have never found himself in the valley. I hear people say to me all the time, the Lord called me to ministry. I've been called by God. Well, have you? Are you sure it was God's voice and not somebody else's voice? Are you hearing what I'm saying? Are you sure it was God's hand and not somebody else's hand? You do know the devil speaks too. The devil leads too. But Ezekiel says yes to God's call. But to do what God tells you to do can be the hardest decision you make in your life. Because when you say yes to God, you're really saying also no to the devil. And the devil makes it his mission to take back your yes from God. 
Anybody who's ever surrendered their life really to Jesus Christ, you know that if you've known Jesus 10 years, 10 months, 10 days, 10 hours, or for somebody 10 minutes, the devil has picked you out to pick on you. And if the devil isn't messing with you, then you and the devil must be running in the same direction. Ezekiel surveyed the site, and he saw a valley full of dead, dry bones. But these were not merely bones. These were the skeletal remains of people who had names, families, children, legacies, and histories. He saw many bones. The number of bones seemed to indicate that the mass, some kind of mass catastrophe had taken place. The valley was full of dead bones. But the Bible also says the valley was not only there full of dead bones, but the valley says they were dry bones. The dry condition of these bones suggests that these people had been dead a long time. That these were people who had not received a burial. These were people who the sun had bleached them white. The sands, they had kept them clean. Ezekiel knew, however, that if God wanted to, he could bring these bones back to life. But there was no hint of hope, no suggestion of possibility, no indication of probability. And so God asks Ezekiel, son of man, can these bones live? Now Ezekiel doesn't answer too quickly, for on the surface this seems like a ludicrous question. For why would an all-creating, all-knowledgeable, all-sovereign God ask Ezekiel such a question? Uh, but let's take that question from 6th century B.C. and let's move it to 21st century A.D. Can these bones live? Everyone at some time or another has been in the valley of dry bones. For somebody, it was a divorce. For somebody else, it was the loss of a child. For somebody else, it was learning you had cancer or some debilitating disease. For somebody else, it was the satanic stronghold of substance abuse or the ungodly soul ties of a relationship that you thought was a match made in heaven only to learn it was a nightmare on Elm Street. Everybody in here has a valley. Everybody in here has a low point. But the question today remains, can these bones live. But let's go a little deeper and take that question from our personal individual lives to the collective life of the church. And look at the people who sit in our pews every week and ask the same question. Can these people that look alive but are no more than dead cadavers, can these bones live? Can our churches that used to be packed and alive full of hope and bastions of energy, but now dying, decaying, and deteriorating. Can these bones live? Can our churches, who are still performing eight-track ministry in an internet download and social media society, can these bones live? Can our churches that know all the wonderful truths about the life, the liberty, and the love of Jesus and all his life-changing miracles, can these churches who know all these things wake up and realize the times in which we live? In the U.S., we've got imminent war with North Korea. ISIS attacks every day. We have school shootings every day. Gun control is out of control. We have the increased admission of sexual assault by high-powered celebrities. And right now, children are being torn from their parents at the United States and Mexican border. Children are being put in cages. The government is sin saying this is sanctioned by the Bible. And I just want to know, can these bones live? Now, the only answer that I can come up with is what the same answer Ezekiel came up with. Oh, Lord God, only thou knowest. But notice now Ezekiel's answer was not, God, these bones can live if you bring them to life. But his answer was an answer of faith. Everybody say faith. Faith does not assume anything about the answer to the question, but faith simply affirms that God knows the answer regardless of what the answer actually is because it isn't the answer that really matters. What matters is that the God who knows is the God who can be trusted. So now Ezekiel repeats what God told him to do. Prophesy upon these bones. Preach unto these bones. 
and all dry bones. Hear the word of the Lord. Now, let me tell you this right now. I've been doing this 24 years. And understand, I know some of you say, oh, you look young. TV makes you look old. Thank you for the compliments. But then somebody also told me you're skinnier in person. I thought that was a compliment too. I don't know. But I've been doing this 24 years. And when you stand in audiences and congregations week after week, any preacher will tell you preaching is not easy. You have to have logos, ethos, pathos, and stamina all at the same time. You've got to be logical, you've got to be credible, and you've got to be emotional. And it's hard enough to preach to those that move and stir around, but to preach to that which is dead and dry is an awful thing. And my travels have taken me, not to South England Conference, but they've taken me, not to North England as well, but they've taken me to some dry, Dead audiences. Has there ever been a view of pitiful Christians who are unmoved by the power of God's word? Is there yet a sight of church folks who resemble dead, dry bones in the valley and can't get excited when they think of the goodness of Jesus and all he's done for them? Is there yet a glimpse of dead, dry bones who sit in the pews week after week and are unaltered by the call of God? I sure hope not, but I'm here to tell you, it's tough to preach to Christians who are like wheelbarrows, no good unless pushed. It's tough to preach to Christians who are like kittens, only content when petted. Some are like footballs, you can't tell which way they're going to bounce next. Some are like balloons full of wind ready to blow up. Some are like trailers, they have to be pulled. And then some are like lights, they keep going on and off. It becomes a tough assignment. But yet, that's often what God deals with. The unusual, the uncanny, the unique, and the impossible. And God says, Carlton Burke, if this is your ministry, I call you to preach the word of God, even if they're dead, even if they're dry, even if they're in the valley. Speak a word and say to them, hear the word of the Lord. Speak a word, and that which will reanimate that which once was, and the reanimating, rekindling power of God will begin to take shape and form to those who hear it. Ezekiel was assigned by God to preach to these dead, dry bones. But as Ezekiel began to preach, something began to happen. I said as Ezekiel began to preach, something began to happen. Revival start taking place. Rekindling started taking place. Reanimation started taking place. Reassembling started taking place. And at that moment, God reverses the process of decomposition. God says, preach the word. And as Ezekiel began to preach the word, decomposition reversed itself. Breath entered the body. Tendons filled the bone. Flesh came upon the tendons. Skin comes upon the flesh. But that's the reversal of the process of decomposition because when a man dies, the normal process is breath leaves the body. The body begins to deteriorate. The skin and flesh decompose. Tendons begin to disintegrate, and there's nothing left but bare skeletal remains. But I'm so glad that I serve a God who can reverse that process. God can quicken the dead. God can raise up life among the dead. God is the resurrection and the life. God is the alpha and the omega. God is the first and the last, the beginning and the end. God says, Ezekiel, preach the word. It is our duty to preach to everybody. Despairing of no one, we're to sow beside still waters. We're to preach in season and out of season. Whether it's two people or 2,000 people, we're to preach just as hard. Because the word says, God says, where there are two or three gathered in my name, I will be in the midst. All we got to do is preach God's truth in God's strength. God will quicken whom he will, when he will, where he will, and how he will. Ezekiel began to preach. And revival took place in the valley. And somebody had knows what happens when revival gets good, when campaign gets good, when revival starts getting good, the preacher gets to preaching, the praise team gets to singing, 
The organist gets to playing. The Holy Ghost gets to moving. The saints get to shouting. Souls stop sinning. Gossipers stop gossiping. Complainers stop complaining. Prayer warriors start praying. When revival takes place, it's like fire shut up in my bones. Ezekiel begins to preach. And the dead dry bones and the bones begin to fit together. And now Ezekiel begins to get happy. His voice begins to raise just a little bit. Ezekiel begins to clap his hands. Ezekiel begins to stomp his feet. He begins to hoop and he begins to hum just a little bit because his valley let him see God perform orthopedic surgery that let the ankle bone be connected to the leg bone. The leg bone connected to the knee bone. The knee bone be connected to the hip bone. The hip bone connected to the backbone. The backbone connected to the shoulder bone. The shoulder bone connected to the neck bone. The neck bone connected to the head bone and all dry bones. Hear the word of the Lord. I'm a witness that preaching the word of God will wake up dead. Dry bones. Thank God for the word. I said, thank God for the word. God's word is sharper than any two-edged sword. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I may not sin against thee. I must confess today, I've asked myself many times, how can people come to church, hear the word, and lead the same way they came. It's because they got the reanimation and the reassemblance. But that's not the end of the process. Because verse 8 says, although they now had shape and form, the bones had no breath in them. Ezekiel had a measure of success in preaching to the bones and a wonderful success it appeared to be. The bones came together bone to bone, but the Bible says there was no breath in them, which means then Ezekiel had done his work in the preaching, but there was still something else that was needed. And that's just like us. We think we've preached and we think we've done something. We clap our hands. I stomp this foot. We shout, people pat us on the back, but let me tell you something. If it's void of the breath, if it's void of the Holy Ghost, if it's void of the anointing, all it is is sounding brass and tinkling cymbal. Life can only come from God's Spirit. The best preaching will not create life. The best singing will not create life. The best testifying will not create life. Only God can give life. Only God can wake you up this morning. Take that same alarm clock to the nearest cemetery and nobody will get up. But God woke you up this morning. Only God can sustain you. The doctor didn't do it. God did it. God is life. All life begins in God and flows from God. All life lives through God and by God. He is the giver of life. He is the life of life. He is the sustainer of life. He is the way to life. He is the way in life. He is the way for life. He is the way of life and he's the joy in life. Amen. Ezekiel must now prophesy to the wind, the Holy Ghost, to breathe on these dead dry bones. Make them live. Now, in the Hebrew, breath is called ruach. Everybody say ruach, which is the same word for spirit in Genesis 2-7. Genesis 2-7 teaches that God formed man of the dust of the ground, breathed into his nostrils the breath of what, everybody? Life. Man then became a living what? Soul. Which means then Adam had form and a body when God took dust of the ground. But Adam didn't come to life until God breathed his spirit in him. Which means then, these bones can't come to life until God's spirit is breathed in them. I don't care what you do at your church and what calendar and strategies you plan. The church can't come to life until God's spirit is breathed in it. Our ministries can't come to life 
until God's spirit is breathed in them. Our communities can't come to light until God's spirit is breathed in them. Some of us are dry and dead. And we will not come to life until the Holy Ghost has been breathed in us. We need new life to come into dead, lifeless bones, lifeless churches, lifeless communities, lifeless ministries, lifeless lives. We need revival. We need reassembling. We need reanimation. We need reclamation. We need rekindling. We need fire. We need life. We need the Holy Ghost. And that's what the Holy Ghost does for us. It makes that which was dead come alive again. God says, Ezekiel, the revival you've just witnessed is a picture of my people. A picture of my people who have been cut off. A picture of my people whose hope is lost. A picture of my people who are dead, who are dry. They don't know who I am. They think I'm restricted to one place. They think that I am localized, but they've forgotten that I'm not only the God of Abraham at Mount Moriah, but I'm the God of Moses at Mount Sinai. I'm not only the God of Moses at Mount Sinai, but I'm the God of Elijah at Mount Carmel. I'm not restricted to any one place. I'm sovereign. I'm omnipresent. I'm everywhere at the same time, wherever you are. I am. Wherever you go, I've already been. God says your bones may be dried up. Your hope may be lost. Your, you may be cut off, but you can live again. Maybe the worst has gotten the best of you, but I'm here to tell you, you can live again. Maybe somebody has done you wrong, but you can live again. Maybe somebody has gotten on your last nerve. But you can live again. Maybe you're down to your last dime and your money is low and your rent is due. But you can live again. Maybe your spouse has left you to raise those children by yourself. But you can live again. Maybe you've been diagnosed with cancer. But you can live again. Maybe your marriage is dying. But you can live again. I don't know what your situation is. But I'm here to tell you today. You can live again. And so you ask Pastor Bird, how can I live again? I'm so happy you asked. Verse 12 gives the answer. Prophesy. Everybody say prophesy. And say to them, thus saith the Lord. I will open up your graves and cause you to come up out of your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. In other words, what God is telling us is, he says, I'm going to resurrect you. Now, you know he can do it. You know God can do it because God knows how to weave his way out of a grave. Whatever it looks like, it has God bound. It can't keep God down. God says, if you think you have me bound, let me show you I can open things up. God says, if you're looking for a nickname for me, just call me the God of the open up. Why? He opened up the Red Sea. He opened up Sarah's womb. He opened up Hannah's womb. He opened up jail doors for Peter. He opened up prison doors for Paul and Silas. But my Bible tells me he died on Friday, lay resting in the grave on the Sabbath. But early one Sunday morning, he opened up tomb doors for Jesus. And I just stopped by to tell somebody, he can open up your life. I said he can open up your life. I said he can open up your life. He can open up your ministry. He can open up your church. He can open up your community. He will open doors. Man is shut and shut doors. Man is open. For when you look at resurrection, resurrection says that God laughs at death's face. God says, I will open up your graves and bring them out. Ezekiel 37, understand biblical theologians, is the only dramatic example in the Old Testament of a physical resurrection. What's interesting is no New Testament writer makes reference to this vision in Ezekiel 37. This passage is clearly one that gives us resurrection hope, just like 1 Thessalonians 4, 16, 17, and 18, and 1 Corinthians 15, 51, 1 Corinthians 15, 51 through 58. What am I trying to say? Church, the grave is not the end. Death is not a period, only a comma 
in the story of life. God will not be unmade by death or hemmed in by the very finitude he himself created. God is infinite. God will not let finitude and the limits of this life be the last words on us. God is infinite. God will not be without his people, and his people will never be without their God. God is infinite. And that's why this vision closes with the fact in verse number 14 that there's not only resurrection, but there's also reunion. Look at verse number 14. And I will put my spirit in you, and ye shall live, and I shall place you in your own what, everybody? Stop there. We had resurrection, but now we have reunion. When Jesus came to this earth the first time, he came to save his people. But when Jesus comes back the second time, he's coming to get his people. The dead in Christ are going to rise first. Then we, which are alive and remain, shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. There will be resurrection, but there will also be reunion. We will be reunited with loved ones who have fallen asleep in the Lord. Hallelujah, somebody. You see, it seemed as if God had turned his back on the Hebrew children. But God wanted them to see that he could not be localized, that he could not be restricted. God says, you can't dictate to me the way you want to operate, for exile was not Babylonian power, but it was my power. You were not in Babylon for exilic purposes because they overthrew my country. But God says, I allowed them to overthrow you so that exile could become your discipline. Somebody right now, you're living in your own exile. You're away from all hopeful possibility. But maybe you're there just maybe, not because God isn't faithful, but maybe you're there because God is faithful. Because God allows certain things to come our way to prove to us over and over and over and over again that he's the one who can get us out of what we've gotten ourselves into. The children of Israel, follow the story, got themselves into exile long before Babylon had come and taken them. And sometimes I've learned in my life, that God will discipline us for the purpose to get the best out of us of what he's put inside of us. Some of us are dead. Some of us are dry. Some of us are in the valley. We need reanimation. We need rekindling. We need resurrection. We need reunion. We need revival. We need rekindling. We need reclamation. We need to wake up and see the times in which we live. We need to wake up and see what God is trying to do for us. We need to get excited about Jesus Christ. We need fire. God is not dead. God is alive. And you can't be alive if you don't have the Holy Ghost. God's people will always be in exile if they don't have the Holy Ghost in them. We need a revival. I said we need a revival. God's not coming back for the frozen chosen. God's not coming back for the first church of refrigeration. But God's coming back for people who are on fire for him. For he who has no fire in himself cannot warm anybody else. So if all the sleeping folks would wake up, all the lukewarm folk would fire up, all the disgruntled folk would sweeten up, all the discouraged folk would cheer up, all the depressed folk would look up, all the discontented folk would lighten up, all the cutthroat folk would build up, all the gossiping folk, if you just shut up, then the work of God could be finished in this world. I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. I 
I know that he is living whatever men may say. I see his hand. Of mercy, I hear his voice of cheering just the time I need him. He's always near. Because he lives, I live. Because he got up, one day the dead in Christ are going to get up. But God finishes the text. He says, I am the Lord. I have spoken it. I have performed it. I am the Lord. In other words, I am that I am. That's who I am. I am that I am. I am everything you need. I am your bread. I am your water. I am your shelter. I am your shield. I am your buckler. I am your bill payer. I am your cancer killer. I am your heart fixer. I am your problem solver. I am that I am. I am Adonai. I am Lord over every Lord. I am El Shaddai. I am God Almighty. I am El Ohim. I'm the plurality of my divinity. I am Jehovah Jireh. I am your provider. I am Jehovah Shalom. I am your peace. I am Jehovah Rapha. I am your healer. I am Jehovah Nisi. I'll fight your battles. Don't wait till the battle is over. Shout now. And oh, dry bones. 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 Hear the word of the Lord. We need revival. We need revival. We need revival. God is not dead. God's alive. Present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And I'm so glad troubles don't last always. I'm so glad weeping may endure for a night, but joy. So excuse me if I get loud sometimes. Excuse me if I stomp my foot sometimes. Excuse me if I wave my hand sometimes. Excuse me if I lay down my dignity sometimes. But you don't know like I know what the Lord has done for us. I know I went to Oakwood. I know I went to Andrews. But before I went to college, before I went to graduate school, I went to Jesus. And he gave me a joy that this world can't give. A joy that y'all can't take away. So I'm done, praise God. I said, I'm done, but praise God. I'm done, but praise God. We need a revival. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in the ferment of his power. Praise him for his mighty acts. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Praise him with the sound of the trumpet. Praise him with the psaltery and the harp. Praise him with the timbre and the dance. Praise him with the string instruments and organs. Praise him upon the loud cymbals. Praise him upon the high sounding cymbals. Let everything, let everything, let everything that hath breath, praise ye the Lord. We need revival. We need revival. We need revival. Oh, come and magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy We need revival. If we can't get excited about this word, how do we expect somebody else to get it? We need revival. Revive us! Oh, game. Praise God for 36 years at camp meeting, but revive us! 
again. I'm tired of Christians who aren't excited about the goodness of Jesus. And that doesn't mean everybody has to do flips. That doesn't mean everybody has to do cartwheels or jump up and down. But if God's been good to you, you got to show some sign. The world is making noise, but the church is quiet. Folk talk about when I get to heaven, I'm going to sing and shout, and all you want to do is sit and look down here. Folk talk about if I had 10,000 tongues, I wouldn't praise them enough. God says, why don't you use the one tongue you've got right now? We need revival. Pass me not, O oh gentle Savior, oh, and hear my heart, oh, cry, oh, and why, oh, us, thou art called. Holy Lord, you not pass me. Everybody on your feet, let's sing that chorus. Everybody, let's go. I'm crying. I'm crying. of the Holy Ghost. We need revival today. If we're going to reclaim men, women, boys, and girls for you, if we're going to snatch them out of the clutches of Satan, we need revival. So God, I pray right now, I ask, I plead, that you would go through the SEC, go through the NEC, go through Wales, go through Scotland, and go through Ireland, go through the UK and wake up dead 
dry bones. Wake them up. Wake us up. Lord, we're asleep. Wake us up. So my prayer today, God, first, is that you would wake us up. Help us to understand the times in which we live. We say it because it sounds good, but Lord, this just might be the last camp meeting. And if it's not the last camp meeting for us collectively, it might be the last camp meeting for somebody individually. And so Lord, breathe your Holy Spirit. Preachers can preach, but we need the Holy Ghost. Singers can sing, but we need the Holy Ghost. Teachers can teach, but Lord, we need the Holy Ghost. Father, I am clear that the biggest problem facing our church is not in strategies, is not in planning, but God, we need the Holy Ghost. Breathe on us. Breathe on our churches. Breathe in our communities. Breathe in our ministries. Breathe in the preachers. Breathe in the people. Breathe in our leaders. It's not just X's and O's, oh God. But there are people going to Christless graves. We need revival. And so Lord God, today appeal number one, by the power of your Holy Spirit. I'm begging for forgiveness of sin right now because the power of the Holy Ghost, Lord, appeal number one. There's a pastor, there's an elder, there's a Sabbath school teacher. There's a Pathfinder leader, a women's ministries leader, an AYM leader. There's an usher, there's a greeter. There are church members who are here. And oh God, we need you to collectively and corporately breathe your Holy Ghost back into our churches. Back into our ministries. There's someone that feels like giving up. They don't feel like planning another Sabbath school program. They don't feel like giving another prophecy seminar. God, breathe your breath. Collectively back into this, your church. And so God, today, there are some church members. There are some members of our fellowship, our family, who are here today. And Lord, you have spoken to them. We need revival. We need reclamation. And Lord... We're asking you to begin with us. Breathe into us. And so appeal number one is to that church member, to that pastor, to that church officer, to that pew member. You're saying, Lord, breathe your Holy Ghost back into our church. Breathe your Holy Ghost back into our ministry, our community. If that's you today, I want you to come stand right next to me. You're serious. You're not coming because we, you just come, but you, you're saying, Lord, breathe your power back into our church. Breathe it back into our ministry. Make my planning come alive again. Lord, souls are perishing, and God, we need life. We need dead, dry bones to become alive again. We were alive at one point, but Lord, for whatever reason, we're dead. We major in minors. We sweat the small stuff. We engage in the paralysis of analysis. God, we just want your Holy Spirit. Breathe. Breathe back into my life. Breathe back into the life of my church. Breathe back into the life of my ministry. Appeal number two. We started this appeal on Tuesday night. We continue tonight. We said Tuesday night, Lord, how you will deliver. But we pause in this prayer again because, oh God, we know you can deliver it because you've delivered many of us. But Lord, when we talk about revival and reclamation, Lord, we're saying we need to reclaim our children. We've got, some of us are here having a great time, God, and we're, we're, we're praising you and we're lifting you up, Lord, and we're magnifying your name. But Lord, somebody in this place, God, has a son, a daughter, a grandson, granddaughter, who was brought up in this faith, but Lord, they have wandered away. In the name of Jesus, sin revival. Sin revival. Sin reclamation to our children, oh God. Lord, wherever they might 
might be. They may be strung out somewhere. They may be on the street somewhere. God, by the power of your Holy Ghost, may they come to themselves even right now in the name of Jesus. Before we get back home, there's going to be a son. There's going to be a daughter, a grandson, a granddaughter by faith that's going to say, Mama, Daddy, I'm ready to live for Jesus. So, Lord, I'm going to pause in this prayer for appeal number two. That son, that daughter, that grandson, the granddaughter, even a sister or brother, even a husband or a wife, they may not be able to stand for themselves today, oh God. But they have a mother, a father, a brother, a sister, a husband or wife that wants to stand in for them. Lord, you know all about standing in. And you know all about taking someone's place because that's what you did at Calvary. That should have been us on that tree. But Lord, you stood in our place and for that we say thank you. So there's a mother, there's a father, there's a son. There's a daughter, a husband, a wife. You're here today and you wanna to come to the front, appeal number two, and you wanna stand in for your child. You want to stand in for your spouse. You want to stand in for a sister or brother. And you want to reclaim them by the power of God. You want to take their soul from the snares of Satan. And in the name of Jesus, deliverance is available to them. And so you know who you are. And by your coming to the front, you're saying, Lord, be with my child. Save my child in the name of Jesus. I'm reclaiming my child for you. And then God, we are going to pray right now that as they pray that prayer, that Lord, you're going to do it. Now, Father, the final appeal. We prayed for revival for the church. We prayed for revival and reclamation for our children and for others. But God, number three is you're calling people to reclaim revival for themselves. Individually, Lord, I can preach all I want. Pastors can preach, elders can preach, but Lord, the Bible says that individually, we're gonna have to give an account of ourselves to you. And so Lord, there's a man, there's a woman, there's a boy, there's a girl that wants to give me their hand today but wants to give Jesus their heart. And they want to say, Pastor Bird, I'm giving my life to Jesus and I mean it today. I need revival in my life. I need Jesus in my life. I need God in my life. I need the Holy Ghost in my life. I know I messed up last week, last month, last year, but right now, right now, Lord, I need revival and I want to give my life to you. And so that's you. You want baptism. You may want rebaptism. You want to rededicate your life to the Lord Jesus Christ. This is what you're going to do today. You're going to press through the crowd. You're going to do just like the woman did with the issue of blood. And you're going to fight through that crowd because you've got to get to Jesus today. Jesus is right here at the altar. He's waiting for you. You say, I want to renew my commitment. I want baptism. I want rebaptism. I want to rededicate my life. I want you to meet me right here, right now in the inner circle. Just press through. Just tell somebody, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me. I've got to get to the front. I've got to get Jesus to bless me today. And so you, whoever you are, wherever you are, I want you to come just as you are. We're going to sing that chorus one more time and you're going to meet me right here in the circle. Don't you go back to your home without giving your life to Jesus. Don't you go back to your city without laying your all on the altar. God is calling you right now. Whosoever will, let him come. Savior, Savior, hear my humble cry. Sing it now. Savior. Right now. Meet me right here. Savior. Savior. Right now. Why don't you? Right now. Baptism. Rebaptism. You want to renew your commitment. You need revival. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Hallelujah. Sing it again. Savior, Savior. God bless you. I'm crying. Savior. 
God bless you. I don't revival. The ice is broken. Come on. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on. Sing it now. I'm crying, everybody. I'm crying. God bless you. God bless you, young man. Why don't you hear? Hear my fight through the crowd. Come on. Come on. Come on. God bless you. Come on. Fight through. Come on. You. God bless you. Call me. God bless you, young lady. God bless you. Do come on now. Somebody else is coming. Somebody else is coming. You need revival. Baptism, rebaptism. I'm crying. Sin. Are you here? Fight through that crowd. Fight through. Fight through it. God bless you. God bless you. Do not pass. Do not pass. We're about to close out. There's somebody else who needs to come. The ice is broken. This is Holy Ghost now. Come on. Come on. This is Holy Ghost time now. Let them through. Come on. God bless you, sister. This is Holy Ghost time now. Come on. Hallelujah. This is what camp meeting's all about. You do not understand historically camp meetings were evangelistic meetings. This is what it's all about. You need revival. Don't you let this harvest pass. Don't you leave this campground. Don't you leave this service without giving your life to the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't be ashamed. Don't worry about what people will say or think. People cannot save you. They don't have a heaven or hell for you. There's no other name under heaven whereby you can be saved but the name of Jesus. I don't care what you did last night. You come today, it's covered by the blood of Jesus. If you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus died for you and he's coming back to get you, I dare you to move out of your seat right now. This is what it's all about. So it's all about in the balcony area, in the main floor, in the cafeteria, in the overflow, wherever, whoever, however, just as you are. Lord, I need revival. God, I need reclamation. I need my soul reclaimed for Jesus. I need baptism. I need rebaptism. Whoever, wherever, however, God is calling you right now. Disobedience is the twin brother. Delayed obedience is the twin brother of disobedience. Don't delay it. Don't wait. We're going to sing that chorus one more time. There's somebody else who needs to come. I know somebody said, oh man, this is taking a long time. Oh, you don't understand. Heaven is rejoicing right now. Heaven is rejoicing right now. You want revival. You need the Holy Ghost. You need the Holy Ghost. You need him to breathe in your life. You've got a challenge. You've got a problem. God is calling. Come on. Let him through. Let him through. you got to get to Jesus today. Let him through. you got to get to Jesus today. It's all right, sis. It's all right. God bless you, sister. God bless you. You got to get to Jesus. You got to touch the hem of Jesus' garment today. You got to be made whole today. Do not pass me by. Let's sing that chorus again. Savior, sing it one more time. Somebody else is coming. I'm crying. Dr. Osai says, you're coming, come on. He's going to pray, but even as he prays, whosoever will, let him come. There's nothing you've done so bad that God won't forgive you. 
there's nothing so deep you've done that he doesn't love you. He loves you more than you could ever imagine. He loves you. Do you love him? So Pastor Osai, Osai he's, he's going to pray. But there's somebody else who still needs to come. Heaven is recording right now. You want a life change. You want a life change, but you want to stay where you are. But you can't stay where you are and have a life change. You got to get up. You got to come down this aisle. You got to let Jesus know. You got to let the devil know. Fight through that crowd. Jesus took a cross and went to Calvary. All he's asking you today is to fight through a crowd to get to the altar. Come on. Just tell somebody, move out of my way. I've got to get to Jesus. Are you here? He wants to revive you. He wants to breathe his Holy Ghost in you. But you got to want it. Stay there and you die. Take a walk for Jesus and you live. Fight through that crowd. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. God bless you. Come on up here by me. Come on. It's all right. It's, it's room. Come on. It's room at the cross. Come on. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. This is why the Lord sent this preacher for this camp meeting. Not so that we could be on TV. But he sent me to preach this message so that his anointing and his Holy Ghost would fall. Amen. Pastor's going to pray and close us out. And even as he prays, God loves you and God wants you. You stay there, you're going to die. You stay in the situation you're in, you're going to die. But Jesus is telling you, you want a new life? You want a new start? You want revival? Take a walk from me. We need revival. And so our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed. And we're thanking God for all that he has done for us this day. We're thanking God because his word says when his word is proclaimed, it will never return unto him void, but it will accomplish its purpose. The valley of dry bones we looked at and it seemed impossible for those bones to live again. This afternoon, Father, we say thank you because you have performed a miracle. Many souls have been resurrected this afternoon. A number stand before the very altar making their decision to now live for Jesus. A number stand before the altar as they have prayed for loved ones and you have heard our prayers. Why, even those stand before the altar this afternoon saying, yes, they will go through the watery grave of baptism. And for this we say, praise be to God. This is what our camp meeting is all about. When the Word of God is preached, the Spirit of God brings conviction. Souls respond to God's Holy Spirit. 
we do not see the man we see Jesus and our love is towards Jesus and Jesus only today for those precious souls who have said yes we will accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior we rejoice with all heaven because sinners have come to repentance there is joy in heaven there is joy here in Prestatin as these souls have given their lives to him and so now father as we make preparations to go and carry out this special service of baptism we pray that the angels will escort us to the pool we pray that family members will join us we pray that there will be a celebration as these precious souls are immersed thank you father for hearing our prayers thank you for your manservant thank you for your word thank you for your spirit who has brought conviction and now we commit ourselves into your hands may the presence of god continue to be with us we pray in jesus name amen amen, amen.